Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Irene Mawel. I'm with Image Africa, and today we are going to have a session um, on lessons <laughs> learned from implementing a new tool during an emergency situation, the Vigilator uh, at Rhodes University, and I'm sure there are other universities that are also using it. Uh, we have our, our uh, facilitators, I would say, in today's uh, session, which is Dr. Nicola Palet, Yuri Vessels, and Neil Crum. And they'll be introducing themselves some more. Uh, just a few things that will be recording the session. So if you're uncomfortable with the record, uh, being recorded, you can change your name. Um, and we'll be sharing the link of the recording in... Uh, in Facebook and also it will be available later in YouTube. So that is what we'll be doing. And now I wish to uh, hand over to Nicola and uh, please introduce yourselves and take over the session. Thank you so much. Enjoy yourselves. Thank you, Irene. Yes, next slide, please, Neil. Awesome. So I'm Dr. Nicola Pallet and um, I work with Neil and I will let Neil also um, have some airtime for introductions, but we're in Churtle, uh, Center for Higher Education, Research and Teaching and Learning, um, and more specifically in the EdTech uh, team. And we've been supporting lecturers and students with remote teaching and learning at the institution. Um, yes, and one of the things that we piloted last year was the Invigilator and rolling out this year. And yes, I'll get Neil to share a few words and then over to Yuri. Well, hi everybody, I'm Neil. Um, I think Nicholas already introduced exactly, you know, where we are. Um, and, uh, you know, we're in a nice space where we can hopefully start to look back at 2020 and see what, uh, what happened. So Yuri, over to you. Thank you very much, Nicola. Neil, uh, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Yuri Vessels. I'll just switch on my camera for a little bit. I like it to be a slightly more personal so that you can see my face and see that I'm a real person. Uh, I'm a lecturer from the University of Johannesburg, and I'm also one of the creators and founders of the Invigilator application uh, that we're going to share a little bit more about today. Uh, thank you for making the time to join us this afternoon, and we hope it's going to be a valuable and informative session. Thanks very much, Neil. And Nicola, I don't know whether there's anything else you'd like to add before we get going. Oh, nothing to add. I'm sure you can get going. And just to let folks know that you can ask question, questions as we go in the chat. And whoever's not presenting, you know, we'll let, uh, we'll facilitate as we go. But we'll also have time at the end for some more questions. So back to you, Yuri. Thanks very much, Nicola. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to start off with a, just a little bit of a discussion regarding where we started, how this started. Uh, where my interests lie in this specific field. Uh, so I think it's important to note that last year during March and April, when we were forced into a hard lockdown, uh, all of the universities in South Africa were facing a similar crisis. And that was that we all had to move into an online space very, very soon. Uh, literally within a, a matter of a week or two, most universities had to convert all of their face-to-face -face programs into full online modules uh, for all practical purposes. Now, uh, as I am lecturing at the University of Johannesburg, uh, a few colleagues and myself immediately realized that with, uh, with the move to online and more specifically online assessments, there are a number of risks that we were not sure how to mitigate and how to address. And these risks specifically uh, related to uh, the assessment or assessments in an online environment and more specifically assessments for certification where we we actually issue degrees and qualification based on the assessment so obviously high stakes examinations that that took place during the course of last year and we had to do all of it in an online environment where we had very little control over what was happening while students are writing the assessments so in a nutshell the risk to the academic integrity of modules were were severely impacted and that was uh, specifically because of the online nature of the assessments that we had to facilitate. 
we uh, got together as a number of colleagues and we started talking uh, about this problem and about these risks that we are facing. And we wanted to do some research on how academics can mitigate these risks in an online environment. Uh, we specifically identified a couple of risks. Uh, firstly, we were worried about the identity of students writing an assessment, uh, uh, assessments and uh, exams that take place via uh, LMSs uh, are open to the risk of third parties actually writing the assessments on behalf of, uh, of one another. So we weren't sure of the identity of students writing the assessments because it was so easy to log into the LMS with, an, uh, with another student's uh, login credentials and then first completing the assessment on their behalf and then logging in with your own credentials and writing the assessment on your behalf. That was the one risk that we were really worried about and over and above that obviously we were also worried about whether students are obtaining assistance from somebody during the assessment and whether they are helping one another when attempting these exams and tests. We started doing some research and we realized that at that stage, the only solution that was available in the market was online proctoring solutions or fully online proctoring solutions, uh, which we then started doing some research on. Now, I trust at this stage, everybody would know what these fully online proctoring solutions are. Uh, it's basically computer-based software that, uh, that works on your PC, so on your laptop computer, whereby students are being invigilated and watched while they are writing their assessments. So in theory, this sounds like a, a good solution uh, as uh, lecturers will have more control over the, uh, the assessment environment. However, once we started doing our research, we realized it's not all moonshine and roses. So Neil, if we can move to the next slide. Uh, when doing our research, we realized that there were a lot of emerging debates taking place and that there already uh, was a lot of literature available on these specific topics. A lot of people were not very keen on uh, these uh, proctoring solutions. And it was specifically because of the, the privacy of students uh, the surveillance that's taking place, students that are being watched all of the time. Uh, there were a lot of complaints about this technology being discriminatory, discriminatory in nature, uh, especially towards uh, women and more specifically women that have children and that, that are working in environments that might not be conducive uh, to a quiet space for them to be writing their, their assessments in. Um, there was also a, a, a term that, that was phrased that where, where they started calling these type of technologies cop shit, where, uh, where students were being watched all the time and they were monitored and, and they were tracked and, and therefore students were really getting uncomfortable with the fact that they are being watched all the time. Now, it's a very difficult thing to balance because there are very obvious concerns about the, the academic integrity of qualifications which more specifically lied exactly in the assessment space uh, where we as lecturers could not guarantee the academic integrity of our, of our modules and of our qualifications because of the fact that we did not have control over the assessment environment. So taking all of this into account, there were a lot of critique for uh, the solutionism and for finding solutions that can work uh, so you had these two, two, uh, two opposites uh, in this debate. So on the one hand, you had the academics that said, but we do not have a choice. We have to enforce these technologies in order to ensure the academic integrity of our qualifications. And on the other hand, you had uh, the, the students and, and certain, certain academics that said that this is unacceptable and the way in which this is done is completely out of line. And therefore, there were people that, uh, that just refused to actually participate in some of these initiatives. The, re the reality, however, is unfortunately that students do act unethical. Um, and as lecturers, we do have a responsibility uh, to, to, to implement certain measures to protect our qualifications and to protect uh, the, 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 the academic integrity of our, our modules. Uh, we also realized that the South African context is quite different to other, other countries. Um, and therefore, we realized that what might work in a first world country would not necessarily work in South Africa. We, we then started doing some research on the full proctoring solutions. 
And we started looking into whether that could possibly work in our context and whether it could work uh, for, for the modules that we were actually presenting on at the University of Johannesburg. And we realized that there are a number of issues that we experience in South Africa um, and, and a number of reasons why full proctoring solutions, unfortunately, uh, is just not practical to roll out and it's just not practical to use. Uh, I've listed these, uh, these uh, proctoring issues and, uh, and problems that we are experiencing in South Africa. And initially we thought it was mainly a third world issue, but as we started working with this application that we've developed, we have soon realized that there they are similar concerns and similar issues even in first world countries. And these issues are that the proctoring solutions require each and every student to have a laptop device. Now, if we just think about the South African context, and if you think about the students you are lecturing, you would realize that unfortunately a large number of students that we teach do not have access to a laptop device. Uh, students also need a constant internet connection for these full proctoring solutions to work as these full proctoring tools stream the video data up to the proctoring uh, servers and databases. And therefore you also needed a very strong internet speed. Now we also know that a lot of our students are not living in in, in environments where they have got access to strong internet, where they do not have access to lots of data, um, and that we also know that data costs in South Africa is a big problem. So therefore, we have to be very data conscious in whatever solutions we try to implement and whatever solutions we're trying to roll out in our institutions. And last but not least, we also found that these proctoring solutions more often than not come at a very exorbitant cost. Uh, these proctoring solutions often charge per student per hour, and we just re realized very soon that it is extremely, extremely expensive and that we just do not have the budget to actually uh, pull this off. We then realized that we've got no choice but to start looking at other alternatives, and uh, we then started looking at how we can develop a tool that can work in the South African context, that can work for our universities, that is not as invasive as full proctoring and that do not have uh, the stigma attached to the full proctoring solutions where students' privacy uh, is becoming an issue and where students are feeling that there's a, a, a big invasion uh, on their privacy. And we soon realized that we have to start looking at a solution that is mobile phone based. And we then started brainstorming and we came up with an idea and a product that we've subsequently developed that we call the Invigilator. Uh, so Neil, we can go to the next slide and colleagues, what you will see on the next slide is just a short summary of what the Invigilator application is. So it's a mobile phone application that works on a smartphone. So from the get go, we, need, we said that there are a few a few very important uh, uh, matters that we need to address. So we said it has to work on a smartphone because we know that most of our students have got access to a smartphone. Uh, in the very unlikely event of a student not having a smartphone, it's also a device that's very readily available to actually borrow. So if you don't have a smartphone and you need to borrow a phone from a relative or a friend for that duration, it's not the end of the world. But we've subsequently found that the vast majority of students do have access to some sort of smartphone. So this application works on entry level smartphones as well. Uh, we immediately said that the solution cannot require a constant internet connection because we know that constant that, that, that internet connections in South Africa are unreliable firstly, uh, and that it is expensive to stream a lot of data. So it has to be data light and this, this tool has to use very, very little data. Um, it cannot be a very large app that takes up a lot of space on your phone. It cannot use a lot of battery power because we're battling with, with a load shedding in South Africa and where students might be in a situation where they've got to write an assessment without having access to power. And we said it has to integrate with the, the different LMS platforms so that lecturers can use it with the different LMS platforms that are being rolled out at different universities. And we said that it has to be cost effective. It cannot be an expensive solution and it cannot be nearly as expensive as full proctoring solutions. So that is where we started off. Uh, and during the course of last year, since about April to September, we developed this mobile phone application. And if we move to the next slide, the colleagues will see that I've just listed the, uh, a number of the main functionalities in the application. 
Um, and what we wanted to do firstly is we wanted to be able to uh, verify the identity of the students uh, writing the assessment to ensure that there is no third parties writing an assessment on behalf of students. And we're doing that through means of selfies being taken during an assessment. So students aren't watched the, for the full duration of the test, but at certain random intervals during an assessment, students have to take a selfie. They're getting notified by the application that they've got to take a selfie. And we then match that selfie through means of advanced facial recognition software uh, or technology to a master photo of that specific student that we have in the database. Uh, so for all of the assessments, we then match those selfies taken to ensure that it matches to the master photo that we have in our database in order for us to confirm that it is the correct student writing the assessment. The application also takes a random audio recording so, so the students don't know when they are recorded. Uh, and that the main aim of that is to ensure that students are not working together and that they're not obtaining assistance uh, from one another during a test. Um, so students have to remain quiet. Um, and therefore, uh, the technology that we used uh, is, is uh, advanced uh, speech detection software to specifically pick up speech during one of those recordings. So then on our dashboard afterwards, the lecturer would see a, 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 a report of all of the audio recordings where speech was detected, and a student can then go and listen. Once again, we do take into account that not all of our students live in in certain areas and do not have a, a living conditions conducive to a quiet space for writing assessments. And therefore, we always try to, to just uh, reassure students that it's not a problem, even if speech is detected in the background, as long as the lecturer can pick up that the speech that was detected is not relating to the assessment, you do not have to worry. So even though they are recorded, if speech is detected in the background, it's very easy for a lecturer to quickly determine that it's it's, it's random background noises and random background speech, and that, that nobody is talking to the student about the test that the student is writing. And therefore, even though they are recorded, we're telling students not to worry about the fact that they are being recorded as long as they don't speak about the test. Furthermore, the application tracks the out of app time. So what that means is students are not allowed to leave the application for the duration of the assessment. And we're doing that so that they cannot access WhatsApp or emails or uh, that they cannot communicate with other students and take photos of the test and send that on. So the moment that a student leaves the application, once again on the lecturer dash dashboard, it's flagged and a lecturer can, can then afterwards investigate specific instances where students had left the application for long periods of time, because that would obviously then be suspicious behavior. We also have customized instructions. So uh, depending on the nature of your assessment, the lecturers can then ask students to take photos of, for example, an ID or a student card. Uh, we can ask a student to take a photo of the, 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 the script that they're busy with, if it's a scan and upload assessment where they've got to write out the assessment by hand. Uh, so they can, then, they can then take photos of that. And once again, we can ensure that a student is actually busy writing the assessment. Um, it's important to also note that the, these photos do not take a lot of time and that we do not, uh, that, and that students are not inundated with requests and that, that it basically distract, that it actually detracts from their, their concentration. So normally we would not uh, request more than three or four photos during a full assessment. So if it's an hour or a two hour assessment, it's, it's four photos that they've got to take and uh, it will not take them more than 10 seconds per photo that they need to take. So it's roughly a 40 second uh, 40 seconds that they would be be uh, taken out of the assessment or where they, where, they, where they would not be able to focus on the assessment, but that's easy to overcome if a lecturer maybe wants to add a few extra minutes at the end of the assessment to, to counter that. Um, we also have a verification code feature where we link it with the LMS that the institution is using. So if it's an LMS based online assessment with multiple choice questions or true and false questions or where it's, a, where it's a fill in the word or essay type question on the LMS itself. We've also got a feature where we link that student with the LMS to ensure that the student writing the assessment uh, on the LMS is actually the student that's sitting in front of the Invigilator application. So that somebody is not writing the assessment on the LMS in one location and the student that they're writing for is just sitting with the application and performing the, the, uh, the prompts on the application itself. And then we do that by requesting 
a verification code on the LMS assessment at a specific time. And for that, the student would then have to uh, press a button on the application whereby a four digit one time pin is generated and that one time pin then needs to be entered into the LMS assessment within a certain period of time. So that is in a nutshell what the application does. So it's not a, it's not a full proctoring solution where students are watched all the time. Um, uh, and it, but we, we, we are comfortable that it does address the biggest risks that we, uh, that we associate with, with online assessments. Now, at this point, I'm going to hand over to, uh, to Neil, uh, who's just going to start off and, and, and explain um, how we then got in touch with Rhodes University and how we then started doing a pilot uh, with Rhodes University at the end of last year and how, what, what their experience was of this, of, of this application during the course of the uh, pilot program. So, Neil, I'm going to hand over to you to, to take it from here. Thank you, Yuri. Um, yes, um, and I think Yuri has already captured exactly most of the reasons why we looked at, at, at um, I mean, shoot, I think we looked at about 30 or 40 different options um, by the time we, we, we got to the invigilator. And we all know that the data, data is a very big, it's probably one of the biggest words of 2020. Um, but in any case, and, and I think one of the biggest drivers is that, you know, most lecturers were very um, worried about the academic integrity of exams, about um, timed assessments like tests. And, 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 you know, there was a real drive to, to find ways to discourage cheating and other kinds of academic dishonesty. Um, and I think that was one of the big drivers that obviously brought us to here um to to uh piloting um in the invigilator um and i guess this has been debates that happened right around all higher education institutions um i don't know about you, you guys but as far as i know uh 2020 was also the the year with the most cases of plagiarism um more so than any other year and you know discussions with colleagues elsewhere have also indicated that a, a, a dramatic rise of, in, in plagiarism. Um, and yeah, it'd be interesting to find out why. Um, but yeah, most importantly, we had, we had a lot of requests and a lot of uh, discussions with, with the people that we support um, around you know, a need for some form of invigilation. Um, others, you know, certain departments tried it with Zoom, they were just a whole bunch of different, you know, solutions or handmade solutions being tried. Um, we then decided to try it out with two courses, um, both of them second year. One is a second year law course with about 250 students. Um, the other one was a commerce subject. And I think that was also about two or 300 students. Um, and unfortunately that failed. Um, and I think that comes up to the next slide of why it worked in the law group instead of the commerce group. And that was around the initial mediation. Um, you know, we were very fortunate in that we could have a meeting with Yuri um, and, and some other of these, these team members. Um, and we could have a, you know, open and honest, frank discussion about, you know, what what the invigilator is and how we can implement it. And unfortunately, the comments lecturer went out um, after that meeting, sent an email to his class, and you know it, it created chaos instead of instead of uh, creating buy-in. Um, but in any case, I think the the big success that we had is you know how how we collaborated with the lecturer where we could implement. Um, you know, we created a a introduction to, to, to the invigilator, why we need it, uh, why we want to pilot it with its course specifically. Um, and we gave them very clear instructions. Um, and uh, yeah, I think it, it, what makes it difficult is when you pilot anything, we, we, had, we decided we actually had a very big debate about should we make it forced or, or should we make it voluntary? Um, we decided to go voluntary. Um, so, you know, the use of the invigilator would not affect you negatively as a student. 
Um, what also made this exam different, and I think this was a, a strategy many, many lecturers use, they would try an open book um, exam. Um, and that was done with an assignment on Moodle, on our LMS. Um, we then also collected some feedback from students afterwards to, to see how, how, how it went and what their perception, you know, measuring things like, you know, surveillance, et cetera, all the, all the issues that Yuri has mentioned before as well. Um, we then also did our supplementary exam in January. Um, uh, in yeah, we also used it for the supplementary exam, which was yeah, in the also a good experience. Okay, I think then I'm going to hand over to Nicola. Sorry, Nicola. Thanks, Neil. And just to add to Neil's uh, discussion, I think the sort of culture of a university plays a big role. Um, it's not one, you know. I think it's a university. Rhodes is a university where students have. You know quite a lot of voice and the expectation that that voice is listened to um it's not like we had seen some other institutions and heard that they had just said you know told their students you will be using this and if you are not using this your marks won't be counted <laughs> um whereas with us you know we had to be very clear um you know in in our in our information and how we were you know mediating this to students and uh, it was one of the students actually who were part of that commerce group that posted on the SRC, I think Facebook page, you know, that sometimes people can, you know, really escalate something if it's not communicated properly initially. Um, so that, that I think was really, really important. So here we had an announcement on, our, on the course site that we actually um, sent out uh, on behalf of the lecturer, I said, you know, look at the tab, at all the info, um, and it's, you know, you know that we had to say, you know, why are we doing this? And we're gonna, you know, we're sharing information in the demo page so they could actually test it out beforehand. We shared, you know, why we're piloting it in this in this information. Um, yeah, and if they were unable to participate after having read this, that they contact their lecturer. Okay, so it's very much about how do you get by and how do you communicate with students? Um, and I think the big thing is that, you know, students actually do care about fairness. So saying, you know, we, we are doing this for you um, and that this, you know, it's, it's in, in your, basically interests actually to participate. Okay, so I said, yeah, we will be piloting an exciting new app for the Invigilator in this course, your participation and experiences um, will help inform the rollout of the app across the university next year. The app is currently being used at a number of South African universities. Um, and you are know, telling them a little bit more about it and that there was going to be opportunities to give feedback later. Okay, next slide, please, Neil. Yes, so, and the order in which we did things, we had a meeting between ourselves uh, and Yuri and the two lecturers, and we spoke about, you know, the tool, as well as the assessment design around the invigilator. So would it work for our open book time assessment, for example? Um, and Yuri also provided feedback for on our initial message that went to students and had to send us a QR code, which was for the demo test. Um, we got links to a video and guide for students with FAQs that Yuri also provided to us. And we shared the student feedback with Yuri then in return. And yeah, we kept having, we had a few uh, online meetings um, and discussed the experience. We then, between EdTech, the lecturer, and the students, we assisted the lecturer with setting up the announcement and then responding to student queries in addition to the dedicated WhatsApp channel that um, Invigilator has. And the lecturer also reinforced the importance of this pilot and how it would be, you know, couched it in terms of um, in, it's, it's integrity of assessments. Um, 
and that they would be to have the opportunity to test it out beforehand before using it during the exam and to get a bit of you know essentially buy-in during a zoom session um, and I think that was really key that it had that integrity focus rather than here's this new tool and yes it's exam time but this is the first time you're going to use it <laughs> you know and yes invigilator provided a whatsapp help desk and then after the pilot we actually wrote a draft report uh, where we reflected on information and feedback and this report then went to departments the academic departments at Rhodes, with questions for feedback and after this you know the both the questions and um, the feedback and the report was shared with our teaching and learning committee. Okay, uh, next slide, please. And I think this is on the feedback. Yes, so many of you who were, especially those lecturing last year, you will know that 2020 was a very difficult year for getting feedback from students generally. So we only had 37 students share about their experience. Uh, most of them made use of the, and the app on Android smartphone and less than half um, via the iOS app, so Apple smartphone. Two used the web version on a phone and another two used the laptop. The majority of the students actually rated the app as very easy to use. And we realized in our feedback that, yes, there were techie issues you know, did the app work? How easy were the instructions? But then there were also sort of deeper questions. Um, so the majority of students said, yes, the instructions shared prior to the exam were very clear. Um, and then they were also asked about whether the use of the app made them feel uncomfortable. We asked them about preferences regarding exam scenarios, thoughts on improving and thoughts around, their thoughts around um, improving assessment at the university. Um, what was interesting is that the students who had issue who or you know they actually had some issues with the students who those who did use it had issue with those that who didn't and they said you know the app is something that had the potential to ensure fairness but they also acknowledged that not all might be able to use it for this you know, because of different circumstances and the number of students who actually came uh, went to the lecture and said look we actually um, don't have a device or because at that stage when we were piloting the software they had not yet made the improvement uh, yet that you could use a single device so both to be uh, for the to run their remote invigilation app and to take the you know you know use the the LMS to submit your assignment so that was something that was I think one of the main things that came from the students and I, what's fascinating, I think, is that by November last year, many lecturers uh, assumed that students all had, by then, at least a laptop and a mobile phone. But the feedback from students um, who said they weren't able to engage with the Invigilator app because they did not have a second device actually proved contrary to this. Um, you know, 2020 was a very difficult year. We don't know who needed to perhaps sell that one of their devices um, for money uh, to feed families, you know, who knows. Um, but it was it was quite revealing in that sense. Um, we also realized a lot comes down to personal preferences. So preferences, you know, people who um, prefer maybe a sit down or an online exam, you know, experiences of taking exams in different settings in general, their views about assessment and fairness and integrity in relation to assessment, those are actually quite different. And um, yeah, it's very difficult to say, I mean, whether people say, say they're more nervous when taking exams in a physical setting or online. Um, you know, we have, if they, the students were asked, if you could choose how to take exams, 18 of the 37 said they would prefer via the app. 16 said sit downs and the rest said they actually don't mind. So there were a lot of times where there was this very, you know, interesting split by a person, I think, which, you know, it's more personal preferences. 
Uh, yeah, and then other things that came up is we know that students would sometimes listen to recordings. So they would listen to their lecturer's recordings and review and regard these as part of the open book exam. But for the lecturer, this was not actually, you know, regarded as open book. Um, so what we see is also students emerging understandings of open book and then assessment in general. Um, so students also asked an open-ended question around what practices and resources do you think uh, are needed to discourage cheating more broadly at the university? So this suggested approaches for discouraging cheating, but that no way, you know, I think they acknowledged that no way was foolproof. Uh, some also even question the legitimacy of these sit-down exams and what is actually being tested through this approach. So while the app was seen as, I think, you know, a step in the right direction, they noted that technology can also be unpredictable, unequal, and can even sometimes add stress if things were, if, if things go wrong. Uh, and those, there were also those who mentioned punishment, consequences for those who cheat. So in a nutshell, this question really showed us that there's no easy solution to discouraging cheating. Uh, yeah, next slide. So, oh, sorry, I realized I didn't say next slide. And <laughs> I was talking about all these lovely little quotes. Um, yeah, so here you can see discouraging cheating is impossible. No method is foolproof. Okay, so every system you put in place can be beaten. Only so much a university can do. <clears throat> so very different perspectives. Um, and I think really spoke to, you know, what are the, the bigger issues here? And I think it's around, you know, the traditional assessment and how the pandemic made that very, very difficult. and spoke to, I think, the bigger picture, which was fairness in general. All right, next slide, please, Neil. And I think you, it's your, you're gonna talk next about the next two bits. <clears throat> Sorry, I just had a seance moment where I'm speaking to myself. Um, we all allowed one of those a week. Um, Okay, yes. And, you know, then we also had to take some time back, you know, take a step back and look at what did we learn? Um, and, you know, the first thing, it, it, it really helps when your developer is a lecturer himself using or herself using the software for their own teaching. Um, so, you know, we could see real examples. We were lucky enough to be to be able to to have a look at that, but also to to work, you know, in in collaboration with somebody who's who's actually you know in the trenches that 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 really helps um we also realized that again like any software um and any you know pilot or any launch of software you know partnerships are essential um and getting buy-in from from lecturers and and students is is important um, but also, I think the most important part is that onboarding and training um, that's responsive to, to the need and to the level of understanding um, of your students in their context is, is, is super important. Um, also, I think most importantly, plan for some extra support when introducing these new tools. Um, yeah, I think Nicola did the lion's share of supporting on this too, and it was um, quite a lot for one class to support. So I think, you know, implementing something like this at, at the largest scale would, would require some more hands on deck. Um, what we definitely learned about our students is that, we you know, to make the assumption that two devices are owned by everyone, I think is a bit difficult. Um, I don't think that was the case, and I don't think that's the case now. Um, I do think that it could be easier to get a phone than to get a, a computer and a and a ADSL or you know whatever an internet connection. Definitely yes. Um, and then also that fairness matters. You know, for a lot, for some students in the feedback, as Nicola mentioned, you know, um, if we are using it, everybody should use it. So from the pilot, of course, that, that would be an outcome. Um, 
but it's also just in terms of fairness of assessment so that we protect the integrity of the degrees, but not just for our degree in the institution, but also for the students themselves. Nicola, back to you. Thanks, Neil. We also learned some interesting things about technology and often a word that is used is intervention. And I think, you know, when you're piloting or implementing and implementing a new app, it's not really an intervention. We've got to think about it as a partnership. You've got to really work hard to get that, you know, pay attention to the social stuff, get that, you know, have your lecturer informed and that they understand what's going on and your students, the students as well. You've got to be able to also plan for tech fails. So who should the students contact? Um, those kinds of things, you know, you really have to have, I think, I mean, we spent a lot of time on that initial announcement, you know, you've got to design that mediation, and you've also got to pay, pay attention to whether the, the design of the online assessment actually fits the tool. And I know Yuri is going to tell us a bit more about that. The other thing, more specifically about piloting a new tool during the pandemic in a high stakes situation, I mean, it was exam, the exam period, is that you need a test run or a low stakes opportunity first for students to feel comfortable. You also need, I mean, we saw the importance of short, clear resources and FAQs that can guide the students. And because some of the questions that students shared showed that they didn't actually read the information that we shared with them. So it might have been even a bit too heavy. Um, and I think the most important one is this support is essential. The tool alone is not enough. Um, sometimes people assume that the tool does the work, but I think really the tool is, is probably the, does the smallest part of the work. Okay, next slide. And I think we've got Yuri. Yes, there we go. Over to you. Thanks, Nicola. So ladies and gentlemen, as an academic myself, something that I've that we learned very quickly is that you cannot rely on technology alone. And as we have seen, uh, that there will always be ways and means around technology. So students that are really clever will find ways and means around it. So yes, technology will mitigate the risk and will, will ensure that a lot of students that would have taken a chance to cheat won't do so anymore. But that cannot be your to use to mitigate the risks in online assessments. Therefore, as a lecturer, I realize that it's very important how I design my online assessments. And this is something that, that every institution has to understand as well. The, uh, technology alone cannot sufficiently address the risk of academic dishonesty. And lecturers need to make a mind shift to assessing in an online environment. So what I've seen with all of the universities that we've been dealing with since and in my own university and in my own department uh, where I'm the program coordinator for one of our qualifications. They ask the lecturers that just has one paper for all students, where they just give out one paper and all the students write the same paper. Lecturers also give students too much time to complete an assessment, where they open up an assessment for 12 hours. And the problem with that is the moment that you open up an assessment for 12 hours, you're opening yourself up for a lot of risk. Um, at the University of Johannesburg, in my department, we've moved back to a single time slot. Everybody has to write at the same time. Uh, it's not open for hours and hours on end, because unfortunately, by doing that, you are opening yourself up to students acting unethically and helping one another because they've got time to do so. Um, we have gone and we've moved to a, a system where uh, where we, we use pools of questions. So where not everybody gets exactly the same question paper, we go to a lot of trouble to ensure that this, the questions are set at the same standard, but it, that it's not exactly the same. Um, we also have questions where, where we've got three or four pool questions. So where we take the same question and I'm lecturing taxation, so I'm in the, in the commerce field, and where we change very small things in the question. So at the first glance, it looks exactly the same as the, as the question of my friend, but we've made some very small changes to it. And then in the marking process, we know which students got which pool question. And if you now are making use of 
a, 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 of certain amounts in your answer that was not in the question we gave you, we know that you got that question from a friend and that you did not do the, the, that specific question by yourself. Um, so that worked really well for us as well. So at the end of the year, we as a lecturing team, uh, my colleague and I, we were really comfortable that, that we really eliminated the risk of academic dishonesty by using the invigilator application. So using the technology and together with carefully designing our assessment papers. Um, so maybe just to give you a little bit of background. So I'm lecturing 1,200 students at the University of Johannesburg and we uh, caught 86 students who acted unethically and who got assistance from, from friends and fellow students. So unfortunately, uh, there is a massive risk in the online assessment space. And therefore, we, we cannot just sit back as lecturers and say, we're just going to leave it. Uh, we've got a responsibility. Um, and therefore, we have to use what we can in order to mitigate these risks to, to, to protect the academic integrity of our assessments. Uh, something that I also think is a big solution, and it's very important for lecturers to upskill themselves with, uh, with regards to what their specific LMS can offer. So what are the different types of questions I can ask? Uh, so they were, we learned a lot. So at UJ, we use Blackboard, and I've, we've, we've learned so much about Blackboard in the process and how to assess and what type of questions we can ask and what, how we can use Blackboard to assist us in this. And, and that goes for any LMS, whether you're using Moodle or you're using Sakai or you're using Canvas or whatever solution you are using, make sure you know how to use it to your best ability. So, so what I'm trying to get to is this, this is a team effort and that, that lecturers need to unfortunately invest themselves in the process. And I can just say as an academic myself, it was a really rewarding process. Um, and I'm not saying it's rewarding because we caught 86 people. I'm saying it's rewarding because of, of, of the, the fact that I know that the module that I presented and the assessments that I set was up to scratch and it was up to standard and that I will not be sending people or students into a job market that is not that is not ready to uh, to to do so. Um, so yeah, maybe just back to the the last bullet on this slide. I want to address this. So too many of my colleagues just just got a normal scan and upload paper where they they, they uh, present all of these students with the same PDF document, um, and students have to scan and upload their responses at the end. There's so much that you can do. And we, we, we have a firm belief that you have to find a balance between scan and upload responses and to online assessment questions. And, and obviously it's going to depend on, on the discipline that you teach. Certain disciplines leans itself towards certain types of questions. And we do understand that it's going to differ from, 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 uh, from discipline to discipline, but, but lecturers have a responsibility to, to invest some time into this. And, and as I say, as a lecturer myself, it's a really rewarding process. So if we move to the next slide, Neil, um, I'm just going to touch on where are we now with the application. So you might have seen that Nicola has mentioned that one of the big drawbacks that we experienced last year was that students were not allowed to leave the application. Um, and that unfortunately was a problem because there are so many students who only have a cell phone. So they only have one device and they've got to use this device to either complete the online assessment on or they have to use this device to actually read the, the PDF document or the PDF paper that they've got to write out by, by, with, with, with pen and paper by hand. And therefore, because students couldn't leave the application, we had the problem where students only had one device and they therefore couldn't use the invigilator because they had to use that device to actually, uh, to actually read their paper or actually complete their paper. Um, we we, we, we uh, introduced the app to UNISA last year with about 70,000 students at the end of the year. Um, and we had a similar experience there where, where it became a very easy excuse to say, I only have one device. So what we've subsequently done is we've gone and we built a browser into the application itself so that a student that only has one device use that one device to use the invigilator application, but they can also access the LMS to write the assessment on or to access the PDF paper on the LMS. So uh, since last year to this year, we've, we've made great improvements to the application. And one of those is definitely that, that students with a single device can now use the application for both LMS and to run the uh, invigilator application. Um, another uh, set of feedback that we got from UNISA, which was very valuable, was that 
uh, lecturers that did make use of scan and upload papers, so where students had to write out the test by hand and then scan their responses and upload, made uh, uh, actually abused the scan and upload time. So at UNISA, they, they were very lenient on the scan and upload time at the end because many students live in rural areas and students do not have access to strong connections or they had to travel somewhere where they can upload their scripts to the university LMS. But unfortunately, if they would give the students an hour to upload their papers, many students continued writing for a further 45 minutes into the upload time. And they didn't stop when the actual assessment time was over, uh, which obviously was a huge discrepancy um, because students, uh, it, it wasn't a fair system. Um, so what we've subsequently done is we have built in a functionality into the application that for scan and upload papers, uh, once the time runs out on the application, so once the, the, the students, uh, once their time is up, they are prompted by the application to take a photo of each page of their answer sheet. And they've then got a limited time of five minutes to do that. And what then happens is that, that photo is then uploads onto your lecturer dashboard and the lecturer then has access to where the student was at when the time was up. So should a student then continue writing, even though the, the, well, into the scan and upload time, we already have a copy of where the student was at when the time was actually finished. And therefore that serves as a major deterrent in, 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 in stopping students from actually continuing writing, even though the writing time is finished. Uh, so that we think is a major, major improvement because that, that completely eliminates that, that risk of students abusing the scan and upload time. Also where students miss the submission deadline on the university LMS for whichever reason, it's now very easy. So once a student emails the lecturer to say, I couldn't upload or I didn't, I've, I've had some sort of issue and I missed the upload deadline, it's very easy for the lecturer to go onto the Invigilate dashboard and to go and have a look at the script photos that were uploaded. We convert it into PDF and the lecturer can download the full script straight from our dashboard. So any discrepancies with regards to late uploads um, are, now also, are now also taken out of the equation because, because we've got a copy of the student's script when the time is up because of the photos that, uh, that they take. Um, lecturers can even download all of these papers that students up, took photos of um, in, in bulk. Uh, so so we've, we've, we've got institutions that, that will mark straight from the, from the application now. So we, where they download all of the photos that were taken by the students of actually download those PDF scripts because we convert all of these photos to PDF scripts and they can mark straight from that and immediately they know um, that students could not, could not abuse the scan and upload time. Um, we've also built in a demo test upon registration so students immediately when they register for the application they, they get taken through a demo test on their device to show them exactly what's going to happen. So once again we're trying to take out a lot of the unknown so that students know what to expect that it's not foreign to them and that it doesn't create anxiety during an assessment. So once they've registered, they, they, they do a calibration test to make sure their device works properly, uh, that we take them through how to take a selfie, how to take photos of specific items. Uh, we show them how to upload pictures of their script at the end. So by the time that they've registered for the application, they've already been taken uh, through it. So lastly on this slide, uh, just uh, so the invigilator is most suited towards timed online assessments and quizzes. So if it's a fully online assessment, uh, you can use the invigilator application with great success and also with scan and upload papers where, where students are expected to, to actually write out the, 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 the answers on well with pen and paper and then scan and upload it for marking. Um, personally, in my module, we use a combination of the two. So about half of our papers are online assessments, uh, so on, online type of, of, of questions on the LMS, and then the other half for the more integrated questions, um, we, we, we then use the scan and, 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 and upload format. So that in a nutshell is, uh, is basically um, where we are at at the moment. So we truly feel that the, uh, the application is really an, an amazing tool at this stage of the game. Um, it's a game changer in, in our context and in our environment where we literally have got no other tools available to mitigate the risk of online assessments. Um, what I am going to do as well, I'm going to share a YouTube video in the chat now. Um, that is a 13 minute demo video of the application where, where the people can actually see um, exactly how the application works and just to give you a better, a better understanding of how it works. 
we're not going to bore you with that demo video today, but you're more than welcome to access that YouTube video to actually have a look uh, at it. I'm going to hand back to my colleagues uh, from, from Rhodes, to Nicola and Neil, and they're just going to discuss where they are now in the process of rolling out the application at Rhodes University. Thanks, Nicola and Neil. Cool, thanks, Yuri. Um, all right, so I think one of the big things that we learned and that we're also seeing here, you know, especially through Yuri's feedback, it's important to know, you know, what, what you know, what is the situation that this tool is best suited to? You know, it's your timed um, online quizzes, assignments. It's definitely, you know, one of the things I think which we got from the lecturers is that it's not suited to all courses or subjects. And you've got to actually use it um, as appropriate as well as, you know, in a low stakes assessment situation first so the students can get comfortable with it. Um, then I also just gauging from the chat, I want to mention that it's not just about tools and knowing what tools, were, uh, you know, suits which situation. But I think university also needs a strategy for remote assessment, and this is something that we luckily had, um, and we were already supporting lecturers, you know, involved in supporting them with remote assessment, uh, and already I think attuned to a lot of the issues. Um, Neil, you want to add to that? Yeah, yeah. I think I think the most important part is, you know, and, and I think Yuri also re emphasized that is that you need that strategy um, that any two is beatable. Um, so, you know, it's about how you combine your assessment strategy with with a tool like like the invigilator, um, which would definitely determine the success of, of, of that. Um, but yeah, it's definitely also, you know, you need to think about, um, and we also still have to think about how do we roll this out bigger? Um, you know, what is our strategy going to be? Are we going to go faculties or are we going to, you know, what, what is our strategy? Um, which is something that we also still have to plan for the scaling. Um, and yeah, Nicola, sorry, back to you. Yeah, I think we will be, you know, rolling it out in the second term, which starts in the beginning of May. And I'll, uh, you know, I think we've at least through the pilot found the niche for what is the kind of assessments where this works well or where the need is. Um, so yeah, and then the other thing, when you actually sign up for the tool, there's an option for a premium support. So there's an additional cost. And for us, this is actually very, very important because we're a team, it's myself and Neil, and we've got two half-time assistants. And we've realized how much just with one course, supporting one course during for a pilot, how much um, support is actually needed. Um, so I would say, you know, people, if you're ever implementing new tools, um, don't just pay attention to the tool, also pilot to get a sense of how much support is involved. Um, yeah. And next slide, this is where you can look at, I think, the website of, uh, for the Invigilator, where you can find out more. And I know Yuri has also shared a YouTube video. And lastly, if anyone has any questions for us. And I know folks have been really good about responding in the chat. And Irene, I see you want people to share some feedback in this feedback form. Any questions? I'm sure some of the colleagues have got a few questions. Uh, we're more than willing to answer your questions. Ingrid, I see you've raised your hand. Yes, thank you. Um, I have two questions specifically. Um, the one is I've been reading a lot of um, studies on the effectiveness of remote proctoring. Um, and the data is really um, show is quite contradictory. So either shows that there's no effectiveness, such small effectiveness that it's really not worth doing it, um, while some other studies have shown um, that there is some effectiveness. So what um, what what studies and in which manner have you um, shown effectiveness? 
and um, and then the question related to effectiveness, what studies do you have um, in terms of anxiety? Um, I had a, a, a friend that ended up using um, this app to write her exam for UNISA. Um, and she said she was so anxious because she constantly felt that she has to check to make sure that she's not missing a prompt to do something. That it really, um, this is an older person, she's not um, young and inexperienced, she has all of the tools that you could need, but, but her anxiety level um, really, really rose with this. So, so that's kind of the two things that I'm, I'm interested in, is effectiveness mm -hmm. and anxiety. Thank you. Right. Um, yeah. Jesus, as as I, I, I have explained to you, um, as a lecturer myself, I, 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 I have experienced the effectiveness of using technology together with a very specific design of my assessment papers. And uh, the proof for me is just in the fact that out of 1,200 students, we had 86 transgressions for my modules last year. So they, those were 86 students where we had clear-cut evidence of students acting unethically during an assessment that we took through a judicial uh, process. Um, so, so, and that is, as I said, that's my own experience with using these two things. So firstly, the application and secondly, the, the design of, of my paper. So, so that, that, that in itself is for me, as a lecturer myself, that's been lecturing for 13 years, uh, ample proof that, that there is definitely merit in, in, in using these kinds of tools. The second thing with regard to the anxiety, um, I definitely think that when a student uses the application for the first time, there could be a level of anxiety. Uh, anything that's new creates, uh, creates anxiety. And as Nicola has mentioned, we, we, we really recommend that lecturers introduce it for a low stakes assessment or even for a completely demo test where there's, there's actually no stakes at all, just to make sure that students are, are really comfortable with, with, with how this tool works. Um, and as I've explained to you earlier on, uh, in any assessment that I set for the application, I never expect of a student to take more than four photos, um, of which two of the photos are selfies that they've got to take. Uh, one set of photo would be a photo of their ID or student card. And lastly, it could be a photo of the question that they're busy with, just so that I can make sure I can link them to that script. So in a, an hour or two hour assessment, having to take four photos that will not, not take you longer than, 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 than 40 seconds to do, um, and you're being notified by the application. So there's no reason for you to keep on watching your phone all the time because you're notified when, when that is uh, uh, supposed to happen. Um, I, I definitely think that, that after you've used the application more than once, there's, there, there's no, no reason whatsoever to be anxious. Um, and I think if we've got to weigh that against the risk that we as academics are running um, with, with regards to, to online assessments taking place remotely, um, I personally feel that that that, that it's, it's 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 not that invasive, and that that the the anxiety is something that I, as the lecturer, just have have to manage, and I've got to make sure that my students are comfortable. I hope that that answers your question. Your questions. Yeah, I can also add something to that. So we were very keen on. Well, we saw the need to try and encourage more of a trauma informed approach. And that's why we really, you know, you know, aim to be more transparent and, you know, say and create a safe space. So things like, you know, this is not counting, going to um, have negative implications for your grades, for example. Um, so how do you also not just implement or pilot a tool, but also do it in a particular way that can potentially reduce anxiety? Um, I can't uh, give you the literature at the moment for stuff on test taking and stress and whatnot. Um, but yeah, I think it's important for lecturers. It's not just about a test or a new tool. It's also the circ how you design the circumstances around that and mediate it. That makes it either less or more stressful. Uh, Pranavan, I see you've got your hand up as well. Yes, uh, hello, Dr. Kukula. It's Prinavi from Durban University of Technology. Uh, I'd just like to say that I've attended a presentation by Jim, and I'm convinced. I just need your assistance and uh, possibly uh, from IFO to convince my EXO committee in our faculty. Uh, 
I've been trying to get them to accept a technology like this. And um, the latest that I heard is that we need to pilot it. So I've offered them my course. I have about 30 postgrad students. I've been trying, I, it, it would have been too much to ask for about three, 400 students. Uh, way forward, please, uh, Dr. Nicola. Thank you. Sorry, Pranavan, I'm not sure what you're asking oh, me oh, exactly, but I'm maybe you can clarify forward. for me. Uh, way hmm? forward from, from your, your side or, or from the guys from Eiffel so that we could implement it at uh, DUT and, and hopefully convince our faculty uh, principal members to, you know, yeah. uh, over this. Maybe you guys could, could do a little demo with us or uh, have a little Zoom meeting. So that we can have one-on-one. -on -one. I will share the YouTube videos. I have shared the uh, links to them, but I, I need a little bit more convincing, and uh, I don't think I'm the right person for it. I've also have sneakily been video sharing video. our draft report, <laughs> so okay. I can share that with you. Um, okay. So I'm yeah, and, and I'm and I know in uh, Eiffel Corp does a lot of Zoom sessions. I think the big thing is piloting is very important, mm -hmm. and. And especially with a small, smaller group. Yes. I mean, we, we're actually piloting another product as well at yes. the moment. And it's really important, I think, before. I mean, because people with the pandemic were implementing things at such a speed, not always piloting, sometimes wasting money. Uh, so it's really, I think, you know, what you're saying is really important that you pilot mm -hmm. first, test, mm -hmm. work out all the snags. Um, yeah, but I'll share my email with, address with you and then I can send you the report. One or two extra members, um, at, at your convenience, I, I would love, love it if you could please do Zoom meeting with us. Thank you. Pranav, and what, what we'll do as well, uh, Romana and myself will get in touch with you and we can set up a call to discuss the way forward um, and to discuss how, how best we can go about uh, a pilot program at your institution. And, and can address the issue with your 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 ex guy. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, I see there's a question from Ingrid. Uh, Ingrid, you say one last question, Yuri. You mentioned you use AI for facial recognition. How did you verify there's not racial bias in the artificial intelligence? So Ingrid, what I can tell you there is that we are working with a, with a very well-known company in the United States, a, a world leader uh, in this area, a company called IDR&D. Um, I can also share their details with you um, for you to, 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 if you'd like to do some research on them. Uh, but they are, well, we've done a lot of research on this. And in my opinion, they're one of the best companies in the world with regards to uh, to, to facial recognition and, and therefore they go to a lot of trouble to ensure that we do not discriminate about, about any, well, against any race um, and that especially darker skin tone people are not, are not, uh, are not uh, how can I say, that they're not um, uh, discriminated against. Uh, so you're more than welcome to reach out to me on that as well. Um, but we, that is why we are partnering with, with, with one of the world leaders to, to, to ensure that that doesn't happen. Any more questions? Right, Nicola, it seems like we've dealt with all of the questions. Yes. Thank you, everyone. I also see it seems like that from the um, from the chat as well. Just a reminder to please fill in the form with some feedback um, that Irene requested. I'll just find the link again and pop that in. Um, oh, but thank you, everyone, for joining the conversation today. Um, and Apple Corp are really great to work with. And yeah, I mean, we've had really good experiences. We meet with vendors often, and I can tell you some of them are a real nightmare. And <laughs> if anyone was working in edtech and making decisions around buying products and, you know, or, or how can I say, being in an edtech position, uh, you are harassed on a daily basis by platforms, providers. Um, <laughs> Um, yeah, 
and it's so nice to, I think, chat to people that have a bit of pedagogy as well and also are local and understand, you know, have similar constraints and understand the South African and higher education space. Um, and I think more importantly, not just South Africa, but the you know, universities where, you know, you have students and staff with resource constraints. Yeah, and I just also want to say thank you to Yuri and Neil for co-presenting and for Emerge Africa for allowing us this opportunity. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you very much, Nicola and Neil. Maybe I can just mention just for a little bit of context. I don't think everybody uh, attending knows this, but uh, we at the Invigilator have partnered with Eiffel Corp. Um, so Eiffel Corp is our official resellers and they are a, a very well-known company in the educational technology space and they will assist us with the implementation and onboarding uh, so yeah so we're working very closely with Eiffel Corp. Thank you very much uh, for the opportunity to, to, to chat to everybody today I think it's, it's always very stimulating for me and I, I love to speak to, to like-minded academics and uh, we are in unprecedented times and I, I think it's awesome that we can learn from one another and that we can that we can share ideas on platforms like these. Bye everyone, have a great day further. Um, and yes, I think Jakob, you can end the recording.